Hello, good morning. My name is Dr. Mossum. I am in AP and CVTS unit at UN Mehta Hospital. Today I am going to talk about aortic stenosis. The aortic stenosis, it can be a valvular type of aortic stenosis, it can be supravalvular or subvalvular. Most of the common cause is valvular aortic stenosis, so today I am going to talk about the valvular aortic stenosis. Now talking about the valvular aortic stenosis, the etiology of it. In etiology, it can be congenital in which it can have a unicuspid, bicuspid, tricuspid morphology and acquired. In acquired, the common cause is degenerative, that is a senile calcific aortic stenosis. It can be rheumatic, it can be because of infective endocarditis, homozygous type 2 hypercholesterolemia, it can be because secondary to radiation, Pagets disease or Fabry's disease. Now, in the patients who are presenting with aortic stenosis less than 70 years of age group, the most common causes by bicuspid aortic valve, that is around 50% of it. It can be post-inflammatory, that is 25%. Degenerative, it accounts for about 18%. Unicomestral, that is 3%. Hyperplastic, 2%. And indeterminate, that is 2%. If the patient presents with age group more than 70 years, the most common cause is degenerative, that accounts for about 48%. Bicuspid aortic valve, that is 27% of the causes. Post-inflammatory, that is 23%. And hyperplastic, that is 2%. Now we are going to talk about the calcific aortic stenosis that is congenital. It is secondary to the heavy dystrophic calcification of a congenitally abnormal valve. It rarely presents before the age of 20. It is slow progressive. It results into important stenosis most often in the 5th and 6th decade of life. It is earlier in unicuspid than bicuspid valves and male present early as compared to females. In the pathology, there is bulky cauliflower-like mass within the cusp, maximum at the site of commercial fusion or the congenital buttress formation, often extending into the annulus, that's left ventricular aortic junction and adjacent aorta. The extension of the calcification to the RCC and CC commissure leads to complete heart block. The valvular orifice is slit-like, often eccentrically located and oriented in a sagittal, most often, or a transverse plane and fixed which often results into trivial or mild aortic regurgitation. Now we talk about the bicuspid aortic valve. It is the most common heart, congenital heart anomaly. It accounts for about 0.5-2% of the general population. The gradual calcification of the bicuspid aortic valve it results into the significant stenosis most often in the 5th and 6th decades of life, earlier in the unicomestral than in the bicuspid valves and earlier in the male than in females. Most of the patients are asymptomatic. About 30% of the individuals by bicuspid aortic valves, they develop complication that is the aortic stenosis. The two cusps of the unequal size, the larger one which is containing a central raphe. The fusion between RCC and LCC is common, that accounts around 86% and fusion between LCC and NCC is around 3%. The coronary arteries may be abnormal. A left dominant coronary system is more commonly observed with a bicuspid aortic valve. Rarely alcapa may be present. The left main coronary artery may be up to 50% shorter. Occasionally, the coronary ostium may be congenitally stenotic. It can be associated with coarctation of aorta and interrupted aortic arch. The abnormal architecture of the unicomestral or the bicuspid aortic valve, it induces a turbulent flow. The turbulent flow enters the leaflets and it leads to fibrosis, increased rigidity, leaflet calcification and narrowing of the aortic valve orifice. The bicuspid valves often are associated with dilatation of the ascending aorta, which is related to the accelerated degeneration of the aortic medium that it may progress to aneurysm formation. The structural abnormalities also exist at the cellular level that are independent of the hemodynamic effects. Inheritance. It is mostly sporadic. In 10 to 17% it is inherited. So inheritance is autosomal dominant type with a variable penetrance encompassing the entire spectrum of left heart obstruction that is the hyperplastic left heart syndrome, aortic stenosis and coarctation of aorta. The associated syndromes with this can be coarctation or interrupted aortic arch, Williams syndrome, patent ductus arteriosus also associated with the hand anomalies, Turner syndrome and Shawn syndrome. Now we are going to talk about the degenerative aortic stenosis. This is the most common cause of aortic stenosis in adults. In the population-based echocardiographic study, 2% of the people of 65 years of age or older have frank calcific aortic stenosis. 29% exhibit age-related aortic valve sclerosis without stenosis. 
It is defined as an irregular thickening of the aortic valve leaflets which have been detected by the echocardiography without significant obstruction. The aortic sclerosis is the initial stage of calcific valve disease and even in the absence of valve obstruction, is associated with 50% increased risk of the cardiovascular death and myocardial infarction. The pathology of calcific aortic stenosis Earlier it was thought to be caused purely by mechanical factors, but the recent evidence says it is a result of an active inflammatory process which is involving the biochemical, humoral and the genetic factors in addition to the mechanical factors. The mechanical stress and endothelial damage, it leads to inflammation, which in turn leads to angiogenesis and valve hemorrhage, which leads to fibrosis and eventually calcification and aortic stenosis. The rheumatic aortic stenosis. The diffuse prominent fibrous cusps thickening of the tricuspid valve with a fusion to a variable extent to one or two commissures, rarely all three. The orifice is approximately center and it is irregular in shape. The calcification is lesser extent. It is bulkiest at the site of the commercial fusion. The rheumatic aortic stenosis is seldom, if ever, isolated. Although at the patient's first operation, this may appear to be the case. In surgical series of apparently isolated aortic stenosis, prevalence of rheumatic etiology is low compared with that when the patients with important mitral valve stenosis are included. Now the pathophysiology. The aortic stenosis, it leads to the resistance of the systolic ejection. There is a systolic pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the aorta. Now this outflow obstruction, it leads to an increase in the left ventricular systolic pressure. As a compensatory mechanism to normalize LV stress, the LV wall thickness, it increases by parallel replication of sarcomeres which are producing a concentric hypertrophy. It follows the Laplace law, that is wall tension is equal to transmural pressure into radius divided by two times wall thickness. At this stage, the chamber is not dilated and the ventricular function is being preserved. Now the left ventricular pressure is much greater than aortic pressure during the LV ejection. The atrial contraction, it plays an important role in filling of the left ventricle and aortic stenosis. It raises the left ventricular and diastolic pressure without causing a concomitant elevation of mean LA pressure. This booster pump function of left atrium, it prevents the pulmonary venous and capillary pressure from rising to the levels that would produce pulmonary congestion, whereas at the same time it man maintaining the left ventricular and diastolic pressure at the elevated level necessary for the effective contraction of the hypertrophied left ventricle. Now the loss of the appropriately timed vigorous atrial contraction as occurs in atrial fibrillation or the atrioventricular dissociation may result in a rapid clinical deterioration in the patient with a severe aortic stenosis. In the aortic stenosis, there is a red loop in the figure which has been shown. The left ventricle emptying is impaired because of the high outflow resistance. The larger pressure gradient to occur across the aortic valve during the ejection said that the peak systolic pressure within the ventricle is greatly increased. This leads to an increase in the ventricular afterload, a decrease in the stroke volume and an increase in an end systolic volume. The stroke volume, that is the width of the pressure volume loop, it decreases because the velocity of the fiber shortening is decreased by the increased afterload. Because the end systolic volume is elevated, the excess residual volume added to the incoming venous return causes the end diastolic volume to increase. This increases preload and activates a frank starling mechanism to increase the force of contraction to help the ventricle overcome the increased outflow resistance. Now the systolic vascular resistance, it also contributes to the total LV afterload in adult with aortic stenosis. The concurrent hypertension, it increases the total left ventricular load and may affect the evaluation of the aortic stenosis severity. Mild pulmonary hypertension is present in about one-third of the adults with aortic stenosis because of a chronic elevation of the LV end diastolic pressure. More severe pulmonary hypertension is seen in about 15% of the aortic stenosis patient. Now, the exercise physiology is abnormal in the adults with a moderate to severe aortic stenosis and even asymptomatic patients have a reduced exercise tolerance. Because although the cardiac output at rest is within the normal limits, the normal increase in the cardiac output with exercise is blunted. In severe aortic stenosis, there is an abnormal blood pressure response to exercise. The rise in the systolic pressure is less than 10 mm of mercury.
Now the cardiac and the systemic compensatory mechanism that attempt to maintain the cardiac output and arterial pressure are the systemic vasoconstriction, increase in the blood volume, increase in heart rate and inotropy. Now the diastolic properties. The LV hypertrophy, it increases the diastolic stiffness. There is a greater intracravicary pressure is required to fill LV filling. This increased stiffness, it contributes to the elevation of the LV diastolic filling pressure of the ventricular diastolic volume. The diastolic function may revert toward normal with the regression of hypertrophy following surgical relief of aortic stenosis, but some degree of long-term diastolic function typically persists. Ischemia In the patient with aortic stenosis, the coronary blood flow address is elevated in absolute terms but is normal when the corrections are made for the myocardial mass. The hypertrophy LV muscle mass increases systolic pressure and prolongation of ejection all elevate to myocardial oxygen consumption. The abnormally heightened pressure at compressing the coronary arteries may exceed the coronary perfusion pressure and shortening of the diastole it interferes with the coronary blood flow, thus leading to an imbalance between the myocardial oxygen supply and demand. The myocardial perfusion is also impaired by the relative decrease in the myocardial capillary density as the myocardial mass it increases and by the elevation of the LV and diastolic pressure which lowers the aortic LV pressure gradient and diastole which is important that is the coronary perfusion pressure gradient. Now this under perfusion may be responsible for the development of subendocardial ischemia especially when the oxygen demand is increased or the diastolic filling period is reduced for example in tachycardia, anemia, infection, pregnancy. Patient develops symptoms of angina even with the normal coronary arteries. Now here is a flowchart which is showing the pathogenesis of aortic stenosis. The aortic stenosis is basically the LV outflow obstruction. So this leads to increase in the LV systolic pressure which leads to increase in the LV mass which eventually leads to LV dysfunction and LV failure. The LV uh, increase in the left ventricular emptying time it causes two type of things that is myocardial oxygen consumption is increased and the diastolic time is decreased. This eventually leads to decrease in the myocardial oxygen supply which leads to myocardial ischemia and LV failure. The LV outflow obstruction, it increases the LV diastolic pressure which leads to myocardial oxygen supply decrease and myocardial ischemia and LV failure. And aortic pressure is reduced which eventually leads to decrease in oxygen supply, myocardial ischemia and LV failure. Now the clinical features, the cardinal symptoms are chest pain that is angina, this is because of the reduced coronary flow reserve and an increase in the demand high after low. Then syncope or dizziness that is ex exertional pre-syncope because of the fixed cardiac output and a vasodepressor response, dyspnea on exertion and rest, impaired exercise tolerance and other signs of LV failure that is in the later stages because of the diastolic and the systolic dysfunction. The patient with the congenital or the rheumatic aortic stenosis present with the symptom most commonly in the 5th or 6th decade of life. Patient with the degenerative calcific aortic stenosis, symptoms commence in the 7, through, or 7 to 9 decades. Patient may be asymptomatic and refer because of the cardiac murmur on the routine checkup or after 2D echocardiography for screening. The aortic stenosis is rarely of clinical importance until the valve orifice has narrowed to approximately 1 cm square. The aortic stenosis usually has an asymptomatic latent period of around 10 to 20 years. The symptoms gradually develop. The exertional dyspnea is the most common initial complaint, even in the patient with a normal LV systolic function. The classic triad of effort dyspnea, angina, and syncope is present in about one third of the patients. Chest pain, angina, which has been described earlier. Now, the dyspnea. The mechanism of the exertional dyspnea may be the LV diastolic dysfunction with an excessive rise in the end diastolic pressure which is leading to pulmonary congestion. Alternatively, the exertional symptoms may be a result of the limited ability to increase the cardiac output with the exercise. More severe exertional dyspnea with orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and pulmonary edema, it reflects varying degree of the pulmonary venous hypertension which are the symptoms of later stage. Syncope, the sudden and transient loss of cons consciousness which has been associated with the loss of postural tone with a spontaneous recovery. Pre-syncope, 
लाइट हेडेडनेस और डिजीनेस ट्रांसियंट एपिसोड ऑफ ऑल्टर्ड कॉन्शियसनेस विद द लॉस ऑफ पॉस्टरल टोन नो लॉस ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस सिंकपी मे बी अकम्पनीड बाय कन्वर्जन मेकेनिज्म ऑफ सिंकपी डिक्रीज इन द सेरेब्रल ब्लड फ्लो ड्यू टू द रिफ्लेक्स पेरिफेरल वासोडाइलेशन ड्यू टू एक्सरसाइज इन सेटिंग अ फिक्स कार्डिक आउटपुट The exercise leads to marked increase in the LV pressure which is leading to stimulation of LV mechanoreceptors causing a reflex vagal stimulation and inhibition of sympathetic tone. The myocardial ischemia causing hypertension and bradycardia. Arrhythmias uh, can be ventricular tachycardias, atrial fibrillation or AV block. Syncope at rest is being caused by arrhythmias. Now the stages of syncope The first stage which lasts for around 20 to 40 seconds is due to the vasodepression sudden fall of blood pressure light headedness pallor transient loss of consciousness at this time the ecg is normal and the heart sounds are distant in the second stage it can be secondary to decreased coronary blood flow there can be presence of cyanosis absent pulse absent heart sounds twitching of body seizures and abnormal ecg they can be st or they can be ventricular tachycardia as af av block or ventricular fibrillation or asystole now the gastrointestinal bleeding may develop in the patient with severe aortic stenosis often associated with angiodysplasia most commonly of the right colon or other vascular malformation this complication arises from the sheer stress induced platelet aggregation with a reduction in high molecular weight multimers of 1 mg factor and increase in the proteolytic subunit fragments this abnormality is correlated with the severity of as and has been correctable by avia this is known as hyde syndrome infective endocarditis is a greater risk in younger patient with a mild val- valvular deformity than in the older patient with a rock like calcific aortic deformities The cerebral emboli resulting in tran- stroke or transient ischemic attacks may be caused by the microthrombi on the thickened bicuspid valves. Now the prognostic importance of symptoms. The presence of symptoms that is angina, congestive heart failure, syncope or resuscitation from sudden death with severe aortic stenosis is a class 1 indication for surgery because once the symptoms are present the average survival is only 2 years with less than 20% chances of surviving more than 5 years. mean survival one year for patient who has developed symptoms of congestive heart failure three years for the patient with syncope and five years with patient with angina the physical examination the key features are palpation of the carotid upstroke evaluation of systolic murmur assessment of splitting of the second heart sound and examination of signs of heart failure now the carotid upstroke directly reflects the arterial pressure waveform a slow rising late peaking low amplitude carotid pulse that is the power set tardis carotid impulse is present in patient with aortic stenosis when present this finding is specific for severe aortic stenosis however many arteries with aortic stenosis have a concurrent condition such as ar or systemic hypertension that affects the arterial pressure curve and the carotid impulse with severe aortic stenosis there would be radiation of murmur to the carotids in which may result into palpable thrill or carotid shudder the apex beat is sustained and it becomes displaced inferiorly and laterally with lv failure the presystolic distension of left ventricle that is a prominent precordial a wave is often visible and palpable a hyperdynamic left ventricle it suggests a concomitant atrial regurgitate um, aortic regurgitation and o mitral regurgitation A systolic thrill is usually best appreciated when the patient leans forward during full expiration. It is palpated most readily in the second right intercostal space or suprasternal notch and is transmitted along the carotid arteries. The jugular venous pulse measures prominent A waves reflecting the reduced right ventricular compliance consequent to the hypertrophy of the interventricular septum that is known as a Burnham effect. In auscultation The ejection systolic murmur of aortic stenosis typically is late peaking and is heard best at the base of heart with radiation to the carotids. The suggestion of the murmur before A2 is helpful in differentiation from a pan systolic mitral murmur. In the patient with a calcific aortic valve, the systolic murmur is loudest at the base of heart, but high frequency components may radiate to the apex, the so-called Galvanovan phenomenon, in which the murmur may may be so prominent that it is mistaken for the murmur of mitral regurgitation in general a louder and late peaking murmur indicates more severe stenosis
ഹൈ പിച്ച് ഡിഗ്രിസെൻറ്റോ ഡയസലിക് മോമർ സെക്കൻഡി ടു ഇയോട്ടിക് റീഗോജിറ്റേഷൻ ആ കോമൺ ഇൻ പേഷ്യൻറ്റ് വിത്ത് ഡോമിൻ ഡിയോട്ടിക് സ്റ്റനോസിസ് The splitting of the second heart sound is helpful in excluding the diagnosis of severe aortic stenosis because the normal splitting it implies the aortic leaflets are flexible enough to create a audible closing sound. With severe aortic stenosis, the second heart sound may be single because the calcification and immobility of the aortic valve make A2 inaudible. Closure of the pulmonary valve is buried in the prolonged aortic ejection murmur or the prolongation of the LV systole it makes A to coincide with P2. The paradoxical splitting of S2 which suggests an associated left mandel branch block or LV dysfunction may also occur. Thus in the older individuals normal splitting of S2 indicates a low likelihood of severe aortic stenosis. The intensity of the systolic murmur it varies from beat to beat when the duration of the diastolic filling varies as in the atrial fibrillation or following a premature contraction this characteristic is helpful in differentiating the as from mr in which the murmur is usually unaffected the murmur of valvular aortic stenosis is augmented by squatting which increases the stroke volume It is reduced in intensity during the strain of valsalval maneuver and when standing which reduces the transvalvular flow. Um here is a table which has been showing the signs and the correlation with the severity. On the left side are the signs and the right side there is a correlation with the severity. So uh JVP prominent A wave no it is not related. If at all the carotid delay and necrotic yes it is related to the severity. If the A2 is audible over the carotids then no. If the apex is sustained, yes. If it is enlarged and displaced, yes. If there is a presence of thrill, no, it is not related to the severity. Cardiomegaly, yes. Soft S1, yes. Paradoxical S2, yes. S3 and S4, yes. Um, in the murmur, if at all the intensity is not related to the severity, but the late peaking is definitely associated with the severity. In the ECG, the signs of left atrial enlargement and left ventricular hypertrophy, they are related with the severity. Now the aortic stenosis and the X-ray what we find the left ventricular hypertrophy may be seen as a rounding of the cardiac apex the post stenotic dilatation of the proximal aorta it suggests as stenosis as at the valvular level now the aortic valve calcification it occurs in majority of the patient who have significant stenosis here is the X-ray which has been showing the calcification of aortic valve there is dilated aortic arch and there is an increased convexity of the left heart border with an overall enlarged heart size now the electrocardiography the ecg often shows left ventricular hypertrophy with or without the repolarization abnormalities that is strain pattern however the severe aortic stenosis can be present without the ecg evidence of lbh the left mandel branch block may be present extensive calcification of the conduction system may result into the first degree atrioventricular block and rarely complete heart block A normal ECG can be seen in about 10 to 20% patient who have significant aortic stenosis. Now the echocardiography. The echocardiography has emerged as a principal method of establishing the diagnosis of the aortic stenosis. Here we can analyze the valve anatomy, the severity of the stenosis, other valvular or non-valvular conditions, the left ventricular response to the pressure overload. This requires a special skill and expertise. It is a subjective modality. the characteristics of degenerative that is a calcific disease it includes increase in the echogenicity and reduced systolic opening commissural fusion and coexist in mitral valve involvement are the distinguishing features of rheumatic aortic valve disease the severity of the stenosis can be represented by aortic jet velocity the estimated maximum and mean transaortic pressure gradients and estimated valve area the pressure difference that causes the blood to flow between the two chambers can be estimated using modification of the bernoulli equation the maximum gradient can be determined by the maximum from the maximal velocity and the mean gradient can be determined by integrating the instantaneous pressure gradients over the systolic ejection period the aortic uh, valve area that has been calculated on the basis of the continuity principle Now the left ventricular hypertrophy may result into LV diastolic dysfunction which can be evaluated by echocardiographic measurements. The echocardiography also allows evaluation of other potential causes of systolic murmur such as mitral regurgitation, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, coagulation of aorta and ventricular septal defect.
A large number of patients, that's approximately 80%, who have aortic stenosis also have some degree of aortic regurgitation that should be quantified. Now the cardiac catheterization. It is an invasive method. Invasive measurements of the trans aortic valve gradient and the calca- calculation of aortic valve area by Golding formula are needed when good quality echocardiographic data are not available. The patient at risk of coronary artery disease require coronary angiography so the bypass grafting can be performed at the time of valve replacement. Now stress testing. It is contraindicated in the symptomatic patient who have aortic stenosis. It may be helpful when the actual presence of symptoms is unclear or when the symptoms appear to be out of proportion to the severity of the stenosis. The management of the patient with the aortic stenosis. Now the treatment of the patient who have aortic stenosis is dictated by the presence or absence of the symptoms. The asymptomatic patient should receive antibiotic prophylaxis for endocarditis. In addition, they should be provided with education regarding the expected symptoms and the time course for the disease progression. Now, there's a, on the right side, there is a flow chart of the management. Now, the aortic stenosis, which is being determined on the basis of echocardiography, where we look out for the valve anatomy, the severity of the stenosis, um, we assess the other valves along with the aortic valve, and we also see the left ventricular response to the pressure overload. Now, if there is presence of symptoms, then we have to look out whether there is any contraindication to the surgery. We have to look for the coronaries and optimize the hemodynamics and go for an aortic valve replacement. The processes which can be used are pulmonary homograft or bioprocessors or mechanical processes. Now, if the patient does not have symptoms, then we have to treat the risk factors. We have to educate the patient. We have to go for endocarditis prophylaxis and echocardiography follow-up is being done. Now, at how many years do we have to call the patient is being determined on the base of aortic jet velocity. If it is less than 3 meter per second, then we have to call the patient for follow-up every 4 to 5 years. If it is between 3 to 4 meter per second, then every 2 years. And if it is greater than 4 meter per second, then we have to call the patient annually for the follow-up. Now, the modification of risk factors, that is hypertension, smoking, diabetes, elevated LDL cholesterol, should be also a major focus for treatment to prevent concurrent coronary artery disease. Now, statins and aortic stenosis. Several retrospective studies have demonstrated that a statin treatment is associated with lower hemodynamic progression of aortic stenosis. Intensive lipid lowering therapy did not halt the progression of calcific aortic stenosis or induce its regression. So the final conclusion on the efficacy of statin treatment can, however, only be drawn by the large prospective randomized control trials. Now, the prospective studies have shown that the average rate of increase in the maximum aortic jet velocity is around 0.3 meter per second per year, with an increase in the mean gradient of greater than 7 millimeter per mercury per year, and a decrease in the aortic valve area of around 0.12 centimeters square per year. However, the rate of the hemodynamic progression in an individual may be more variable. Now, the surgical consideration. The operative mortality is ideally to be in range of around 2 to 3 percent. However, it may be as high as 10% in endolity and even higher in the presence of significant comorbidity. The prosthetic valve-related long-term morbidity and mortality must be taken into account. Thromboembolism, bleeding, endocarditis, valve thrombosis, paravalvular regurgitation and valve failure that occur at the rate of around 2-3% to per year. Now, the risk stratification by echocardiography. The peak aortic jet velocity and LV ejection fraction as well as the rate of hemodynamic progression have been identified as independent predictors of outcome, that is retrospective. The aortic valve calcification has turned out to be a powerful independent predictor of the outcome. The combination of notably calcified valve with a rapid increase in the velocity of more than 0.3 meter per second from one to following visit within one year has been shown to identify as high risk of group of patients. Approximately 80% of them require surgery or they'll die within two years. Now the symptomatic aortic stenosis. The prognosis of the symptomatic patient is extremely poor without surgical treatment. In recent studies, the symptomatic patient with aortic stenosis who have refused surgery have had 5-year survival rate of only 15-50%. to The option for the valve replacement include the pulmonary autograph, autograph procedure, bioprocessors and mechanical valve and recently percutaneous aortic valve replacement. Now, uh, this is a, a table which has been showing the uh, stages of valvular aortic stenosis on the basis of VHA guidelines 2020. 
Now stage A, that is def by definition, at risk of aortic stenosis. In this, the valve anatomy can be bicuspid aortic valve or other congenital valve anomaly, or there can be presence of aortic valve sclerosis. In the valve hemodynamics, the um, maximum velocity is less than 2 meter per second with a normal leaflet motion. The hemodynamic consequence would be none and there is no presence of symptoms at this stage. In stage B, that is progressive aortic stenosis, in the valve anatomy, there would be mild to moderate leaflet calcification or fibrosis of bicuspid or a tricuspid valve with some reduction in the systolic motion or it can be rheumatic valve changes with commercial fusion. The valve hemodynamics would be velocity would be between 2 to 2.9 meter per second with a mean pressure gradient of around less than 20 millimeter of mercury. That is mild. In moderate aortic stenosis, the velocity would be around 3 to 3.9 meter per second with a gradient of around 20 to 39 millimeter mercury. In this stage, the hemodynamic consequence would be early LV diastolic dysfunction and the EF would be normal. The symptoms would not be present at this stage. Now, the state C, that is an asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. C1, that is asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis, the valve leaflet would be severe calcification, fibrosis, or congenital stenosis with a severely reduced leaflet opening. The hemodynamics would be the velocity would be more than 4 meter per second, mean gradient would be more than 40 millimeter of mercury, the valve area would be typically less than 1 centimeter square. Very severe aortic stenosis, the aortic valve velocity would be more than 5 meter per second with a mean gradient more than 60 millimeter of mercury. Now the hemodynamic consequence over here would be LV diastolic dysfunction, mild LV hypertrophy and normal ejection fraction. The symptoms would be none. The exercise testing is reasonable to confirm symptom status. Now C2, that is asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis with the LV systolic, diastolic, uh, LV systolic dysfunction. In this, the anatomy would be severe left leaflet calcification, fibrosis or congenital stenosis with a severely reduced leaflet opening. The velocity would be more than 4, the mean gradient would be more than 40 mm mercury, the valve area would be less than 1 cm square. If the hemodynamic consequence would be the EF is less than 50%, the symptoms would not be present at the stage. Now D, that is symptomatic severe aortic stenosis. Now the symptomatic severe high rate aortic stenosis, the anatomy would be leaflet calcification, fibrosis, congenital stenosis with severely reduced leaflet opening. The hemodynamics, the velocity would, would be more than 4 meter per second, the gradient would be more than 40, the area would be less than 1 centimeter square. Um, it can be mixed aortic stenosis with aortic regurgitation can also be there. The hemodynamic consequence would be LV diastolic dysfunction, hypertrophy and pulmonary hypertension may be present. The symptoms here would be exertional dyspnea, decrease in exercise tolerance or heart failure, exertional angina, exertional syncope or presyncope. Now D2, symptomatic, severe, low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis with reduced ejection fraction. Here the severe leaflet calcification fibrosis with reduced leaflet motion. The hemodynamics, the area would be less than 1 cm square. The velocity would be less than 4 m per second and mean gradient would be less than 40 mm of mercury. But in the dobutamine stress echocardiography, the area would be less than 4 cm square with the velocity which may increase to more than 4 m per second at any flow rate. The consequence of a hemodynamic consequence would be LV diastolic dysfunction, hypertrophy, EF less than 40%, 50%. The symptoms would be heart failure, angina, syncope or presyncope. Now the symptomatic severe aortic stenosis, D3. Symptomatic severe low-grade aortic stenosis with normal LVF or paradoxical low-flow severe aortic stenosis. Anatomy would be same. The hemodynamics, the area would be less than 1 cm square with a uh, velocity less than 4 m per second. The mean gradient would be less than 40 mm of mercury and stroke volume index would be less than 35 ml per meter square. Measure when the patient is normotensive, that is the silic pressure is less than 140 mm of mercury. The consequence would be increase in the LV relative wall thickness, small LV caliber with a low stroke volume, restrictive diastolic filling and the EF would be greater than 50%. The symptoms would be heart failure, angina, syncope or presyncope. Uh, here is the uh, slide which has been showing the class of recommendation and the level of evidence. Now I'm going to talk about timing of intervention of aortic stenosis according to the AHA guidelines 2020. 
Now, one A indication in the adults with severe or high gradient aortic stenosis, that is stage D1, and symptoms of exertional dyspnea, high failure, angina, syncope, or pre syncope by the history or on exercise testing, AVR is indicated. 1B NR in asymptomatic patient with severe aortic stenosis and an LV EF of less than 50%, that is stage C2, AVR is indicated. 1B NR in asymptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis, that is stage C1, who are undergoing cardiac surgery for other indication, AVR is indicated. Then 1B NR in asymptomatic patient with low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis with reduced uh, EF, stage D2, AVR is indicated. In um, 1B NR in symptomatic patient with low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis with a normal EF, that is D3, AVR is recommended if AS is the most likely cause of symptoms. Now, 2A, level of evidence B and R, in apparently asymptomatic patient with severe aortic stenosis, stage C1 and low surgical risk, AVR is reasonable when an exercise test demonstrates decrease in exercise tolerance or a fall in the systolic pressure which is greater than 10 mm of mercury from baseline to peak exercise. Now, 2A, level of recommendation B, R. In asymptomatic patient with severe, very severe aortic stenosis, defined as an aortic velocity of more than 5 meter per second and low surgical risk, AVR is reasonable. Now to A, uh, level of evidence B and R. In apparently asymptomatic patient with severe aortic stenosis, state C1 and low surgical risk, AVR is reasonable when the serum, uh, the BNP level is greater than 3 times normal. Now, 2A, BNR, in asymptomatic patient with a high gradient severe aortic stenosis, state C1, and low surgical risk, AVR is reasonable when the serial testing shows an increase in jet velocity, more than 0.3 meter per second per year. Now, 2B, and uh, level of evidence BNR, in asymptomatic patient with a severe high gradient aortic stenosis, that is state C1, and a progressive decrease in LVEF on at least three serial imaging studies to less than 60%, AVR may be considered. Now, 2B, um, level of evidence C, expert opinion, in the patient with moderate aortic stenosis, stage B, who are undergoing cardiac surgery for other indication, AVR may be considered. Now here is a flowchart which is showing the timing of intervention for the aortic stenosis. Now there is an abnormal aortic valve with a reduced systolic opening. Now whether the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic. Now the symptoms are due to the aortic stenosis. Then uh, we have to classify whether it is severe. Now the severe has been defined by velocity is more than 4 meter per second and the gradient is more than 40 millimeter mercury. Then we have to opt for the aortic valve replacement. It can be surgical or we can opt for TAVI. Now, if the velocity is less than 4 meter per second and the valve area is less than 1 centimeter per square, if at all, yes, then severe aortic sta uh, stenosis stage 2, then we have to do the dobutamine uh, stress echo. If the velocity, it increases more than 4 meter per second at any flow rate, then we have to opt for the um, aortic valve replacement. If it is, no. If the severe aortic stenosis, then stage D3, the valve area is less than 0.6 centimeter square per meter square and the stroke volume is less than 35 milliliter per meter square. The aortic stenosis is most likely the cause of symptoms, then we have to opt for the aortic valve replacement. Now, the patient does not have symptoms. That is, the aortic stenosis is at state C, where the velocity is greater than 4 meter per second. Then we have to see whether the ejection fraction is less than 50%. Yes, then we have to offer the valve uh, replacement. If at all we are opting for other cardiac surgery, then we have to uh, go for AVR also. Now, the exercise tolerance test with a decrease in uh, blood pressure and exercise capacity, then we have to go for a surgical valve replacement. If the velocity is more than 5 meter per second, if the BNP is greater than 3 times the normal, there is a rapid disease progression and there is a low surgical risk, then we have to go for a surgical uh, aortic valve replacement. If the EF is less than 60% on 3 serial studies, then we have to go for the surgical valve replacement. Now, stage uh, B, aortic... Um, Aortic stenosis stage B, where the velocity is between 3 to 3.9 meter per second. If at all we are going for other cardiac surgery, then we should also go for aortic valve replacement. Now, the choice of intervention that is a mechanical versus bioprosthetic aortic uh, AVR.
now uh, class um, the one c uh, expert opinion in the patient with an indication of avr the choice of prosthetic valve should be based on a shared decision making process that accounts for patient values and preferences and it includes the discussion of indication for and the risk of anticoagulation therapy and the potential need for and the risk associated with the valve free intervention now the class uh, class of uh, recommendation 1 level of evidence c expert opinion for the patient of any age requiring avr for whom the vitamin k antagonist anticoagulant therapy is contraindicated cannot be managed appropriately or is not desired then a biprosthetic avr is recommended now uh, to uh, class of recommendation 2a and level of evidence b um for the patient which is less than 50 years of age who do not have any contraindication to anticoagulation and require an avr it is reasonable to choose a mechanical aortic pros- uh, prosthesis over a biprosthetic valve now we have class of recommendation 2a level of evidence b and r for the patients between 50 to 65 years of age group who require an aortic valve replacement and who do not have a contraindication to anticoagulation it is reasonable to individualize the choice of either mechanical or biprosthetic aortic valve with a consideration of individual patient factors and often informed shared decision making now to abr in patients greater than 65 years of age group who require avr it is reasonable to choose a biprosthetic valve over a mechanical one now to b uh, to b uh, level of evidence uh, b in the patient less than 50 years of age who prefer biprosthetic aortic valve and have appropriate anatomy replacement of aortic valve by pulmonic autograft that is the ross procedure may be considered as a comprehensive valve care this is a flow chart which is showing the uh, choice of the surgical aortic valve replacement versus stavi when the avr is indicated for the valvular aortic stenosis now the adult patient with the aortic stenosis the indications have already been discussed before so this has to be a shared decision making when the patient and the heart valve team with the discussion of the surgical and stavi now the risk assessment is to be done if the patient does not have risk then we have to look whether the vitamin k uh, antagonist anticoagulation can be taken or not if at all there is no contraindication to the anticoagulation or uh, then we have to look for the patient age group if at all is less than 50 years then we first choice would be uh, the mechanical aortic valve the class of recommendation is 2a or we can go for pulmonic autograft that is 2b now uh, if at all the age group is between 50 to 65 then we have to go uh, can be either mechanical or biprosthetic valve that is class of recommendation is 2a if the age group is greater than 65 then we can go for biprosthetic valve that is class of recommendation is 2a if the patient cannot take a vitamin k antagonist anticoagulation that is contraindicated or cannot be managed or is not desired then we have to offer biprosthetic valve now um in the biprosthetic valve now the patient with a symptomatic severe aortic stenosis that is d1 d2 d3 uh, uh, class or asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis with a low ejection fraction now if if at all it is not there then we have to go for a surgical valve replacement that is biprosthetic valve can be placed now if the patient uh, has a valve and vascular anatomy are favorable and they are suitable for transfemoral type tavi if at all no it is not suitable then we have to go for surgical and if at all yes then we have to see the life expectancy if the age or uh, is less than 65 then we have to go for a surgical replacement if the age is between 65 to 80 years then we have to uh, f- uh, f- surgical replacement um, that is the first choice that is class of recommendation is one and transfemoral tavi can also be done that is class of recommendation is one if the age is greater than 80 years then the tavi is uh, opted first now if the patient uh, risk assessment is high if there is an sts is more than 8% or the frailty measures more than 2 or the less than 2 organ systems are uh, there or procedure specific impediment then we have to see life expectancy with an acceptable quality of life which is more than 1 year if the patient preferences and values yes if the vascular uh, and the valve anatomy is suitable then we have to go for tavi and if it is n- not uh, suitable then we have to go for palliative care and if the life expectancy is less than 1 year then we have to go for uh, palliative care